welcome to today's CIT Tech for Business podcast. Today, we're sitting down with Todd and Nate to discuss the 2022 Healthcare Cybersecurity Act. Let's kick it off with you guys introducing yourselves today. Sure. Thanks, Tara. Good morning. I am Todd. I am CIT's Chief Operations Officer. I'm also our CISO. And I'm Nate. I'm our Director of Cybersecurity here. Uh, today, as as Tara had mentioned, we're we're going to talk about uh, an act that was introduced back in March, um, and it is referred to as the Healthcare Cybersecurity Act of 22, as Tara mentioned. Um, as you may or may not know, uh, there's a lot going on in the world. I'm pretty sure everybody feels it at this point. The way that the act opens up is it it says, and I'm going to read this directly just so you have context for it is. In the light of the threat of Russian cyber attacks, we may we must take proactive steps to enhance the cybersecurity of our healthcare public health entities. Um, this was ent- entered by Senator Rosen, and as I mentioned, it's no surprise <laughs> the increase in cyber attacks has been significant, and it's just been increasing year over year. In the context of what we've seen over just recently, in the last two years, is a focus on healthcare industry specifically. Um, so, for example, I think they said last year there was um, a fairly significant increase, about 50 million uh, PII records were disclosed. And they were attributing that directly to the rapid move in the industry to digital. Um, part of that came as part of the pandemic. There's just been this move to get more and more digitized. Um, One of the statistics that showed up for last year was that IBM came back and said that each data breach for the cost in healthcare specific is roughly around $9.23 million in 21, significantly higher than any other industry. Um, and, And it's probably The reason behind that is the data that's there is just a lot more valuable than a lot of other industries. There's a lot more PII that's available for the bad guys to take. Um, And of course, when there are attacks, it's also a lot more uh, pervasive and it can have a much larger impact. And and I think Nate had a few things that he wanted to add on, on the possible impacts of attacks on healthcare in particular. Yeah, so as Todd mentioned, uh, the the healthcare cause for a data breach has just continued to skyrocket. Um, there is studies out there that you know will scour the dark web, analyzing how much some of this data will actually cost to acquire um, after the data has been exfiltrated or stolen from the network and being sold to other uh, threat actors or you know other nefarious individuals. Healthcare is at least double. Um, any other industry per record uh, that's stolen. So this is something that was provided by HHS itself. Uh, In their study, uh, they said that the healthcare per record or uh, per capita uh, record is about 400, or technically it's $408 per record. The next lowest is financial, that's 206. So health records are significantly more valuable to a threat actor um, simply just because of the sensitivity as Todd had mentioned. Um, One of the really important things that I did want to highlight here, just because so many studies out there do discuss how much a data breach costs, and in the healthcare industry, I really do believe that's completely missing the mark. The entire intent of healthcare is to protect individuals and their livelihood. Um, That's why every healthcare person is in the industry. They're there to help serve and protect and uh, support others. So the one thing that I did want to mention is there's actually over the last couple of years now been a couple different cases of individuals um, who didn't make it, you know, they passed away directly related to cyber threats. Um, One of the first ones that came out was in June of 2020. Uh, This one was, um, there's a a kind of a whole lawsuit that's going on. So there's, it's not completely founded in a basis quite yet, but it was an Alabama woman that lost an infant. Um, The umbilical cord got wrapped around the the child's neck and uh, the whole monitoring and alerting system at that hospital was impacted from a cyber incident. So it didn't uh, support, uh, allegedly didn't 
notify the staff in time to be able to save that child. Uh, so that was one of the first ones. And then in September of 2020, uh, there was a woman in Germany who was uh, being rushed to a hospital and then due to a cyber incident had to be rerouted about 30 kilometers in another direction, uh, didn't make it again. So that's where I think really the impact of cybersecurity comes on healthcare. The finances are really, really important, but as a healthcare facility and uh, the, the, the business leaders and uh, healthcare leaders, we have to take it a step further and going, this actually impacts human lives today, right? Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. It does, I mean, I, just in general, cybersecurity impacts everybody, right? Unfortunately, um, it has a significant and potentially a much more dire impacts in the healthcare industry. And as you mentioned, and I think it's a absolutely fantastic point is the individuals that work there, they do that for a reason. And there is a lot of intrinsic values and reasons they do that. And so it can be considerably more dramatic, the impact from these kinds of things. Um, one thing that I kind of wanted to add on here was uh, this is not necessarily new to healthcare. HIPAA has been around for, I, I don't even know, I didn't look it up because I, and I don't remember, but HIPAA has been around forever. So the fact that there's compliance out there, it's not new. Um, I, I am going to give you just a quick snippet overview of what's in this particular act and how they're trying to move the industry forward. But one of the things that I kind of wanted to highlight partic in particular is that Compliance is here to stay. It's not going away. While we're today, we're talking specifically about healthcare. We're starting to see it everywhere, and I think in a few other podcasts, we've alluded to it or even talked to it to some degree. It's coming. There's a reason for it. Unfortunately, it hasn't been something that's been easy to address or solve on a case by case base, basis, and therefore that's where you're seeing the compliance come in. Um, so, really, really briefly on a super high level. What this particular act is trying to do in summary is they're saying that this particular act is designed to make sure it addresses the cybersecurity staffing shortage. I'm going to circle back on this. So Nate and I are going to talk about this a little bit more, but this really, really quick headlines, if you will. Require CISA and HHS to collaborate, including by entering into an agreement to improve cybersecurity in the healthcare and public health sectors as defined by CISA. Authorize cybersecurity training to healthcare and public health sectors. And the last but not least, require CISA to conduct a study on specific cyber risks facing the healthcare and public health sector. Backing up, I wanted to go to that very first piece, which is addressing the cybersecurity staffing shortage. I, I pulled some statistics before we got on the, the, the podcast today and just running through them really, really briefly. The shortage in cybersecurity is not going away. Um, I want to say two years ago, we were at roughly about 500,000 open recs. Today, looking at it from a report from Bloomberg, it was over 600,000 security roles that were open as of March of this year. Um, diving a little bit deeper, what does that look like? One of the main certifications that the industry is looking for to prove that security individuals know what they're doing, know that they're what they're talking about, helping move the industry forward as it's referred to as CISP. Um, and it is a requirement or a certification that has years of experience as well as knowledge. Of those 600,000 openings, over 106 of them are requiring the, cer the CISP certification itself. Uh, to kind of give you a little more context of that, there's only 90,000 CISP certified security prof professionals today. So there's more job openings than there are existing certified individuals. Yeah, the, the one other thing that, um, and this is even a, a challenge for CIT, we, we fight every single day, is how do you also keep security individuals uh, motivated, engaged, and um, compensated well enough to be able to um, ensure the success of your organization, uh, right, and help protect to the levels that they need to be protected at. The couple things uh, for just some basic statistics, because Todd was mentioning the, um, the, the CISP and being in such demand. Um, for those that aren't familiar with the CISP, it's the Certified Information System Security Professional. Um, it is one of the de facto certs 
for a security individual. Um, and it is also one of the most um, highly compensated certifications out there because it is specifically tied to our requirements. You need to have so many years of experience in the industry to be able to obtain it and have authorization for it. Just from a couple simple numbers, you're looking at at least a six figure income for an individual that has the CISP. Um, so the reason why we bring that up is there are entry level roles, but you also still do need those industry leaders to be able to help guide and develop the security program within the organization. Um, what that means is the salaries need to be budgeted for, right? And then additionally, cybersecurity, because it's in such a demand right now, there is a lot of competitiveness on the market today. So you may even be able to, or may be required to have to pay a premium for that individual and for that retention. Um, in terms of additional uh, retention, continual training, helping uh, security professionals fight a mission, right? Uh, so I, I kind of called this out a little bit earlier about the protecting human lives is saying, please just protect the systems and our finances isn't enough to retain a security individual. It may for many of them, but at the core of many security professionals, they're fighting for mission. They want to protect something, right? And so you have to align that strategy and vision uh, directly to their roles. And then the other thing would be adapting rapidly to their growth. So if a security professional is growing rapidly, you have to adapt with them. Um, for example, many organizations do annual reviews. That may not be enough to retain that individual. Uh, it, it's really, really hard. I've seen some people do quarterly reviews. Some people even do monthly reviews and adjustments on salary simply to stay competitive in the market, right? So um, just from a straight uh, finance perspective, you have to budget, have to adapt, you have to train, and you have to provide some type of vision to properly um, sustain these employees and retain uh, these employees in the environment. Yeah, I think you made a lot of really good points there. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of stuff that's going on in that that summary, which is a it's hard to find the individuals which we kind of talked about, right? It's also very difficult to train them, retain them, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, with that in mind, there is help to be had. Obviously, this is a little self-serving for me, and I apologize for doing this, but there are organizations like CIT that are doing this already, right? We're out there looking for tools. We're looking for individuals. We're trying to find a way to force, um, force multiply. Because it's difficult to find them, it's difficult to pull them away. When the individual finds the right fit, they tend to stick. Uh, Nate touched on that a lot. And that's something that we're we're trying to instill. But you, what that means to a lot of the people that we work with is, in a lot of cases, they don't have the opening or they're not large enough to afford that six-figure salary that they're going to go, hey, how do I get that expertise? And there are partners out there for you to find that will help you get and supplement where you need it. Um, the last piece that I wanted to touch on before we move on to the next piece is the intent of this really is finding and growing talent. There are schools and, and there's been a significant increase in the training of cybersecurity individuals. There are uh, internships that are out there, et cetera. So some of that's already happening, but this is the intent of this particular piece of the legislation is designed to say, it's a big deal. We really need to address this on a national scale. So that's where that's coming from. Um, what the details look like to be determined, but it's it's coming. It's great news for the industry and it's great news for companies and especially for healthcare. Um, the next item that was listed on here was require CISA and HSH to collaborate, including entering into an agreement to improve cybersecurity in the sector. Um, so one of the questions I was going to ask Nate is what, what do the people that potentially are listening to this podcast or watching on YouTube, what can they do now, if anything, to, to get going on this particular piece, or should they even worry about it at the moment? Yeah, it's a good question. The, the, the one of the main takeaways that I, while reading this article, uh, or, you know, Bill was, it's very high level right it's it's hard to take that and conceptualize what does this mean for my day-to-day -day activities um because 
none of us necessarily work directly with HHS, and then none of us are directly working with CISA. So breaking that down a little bit further, um, in terms of information security collaboration between uh, the federal government and the public sector and of critical infrastructure, for a healthcare individual, uh, there is the HISAC, which is the information sharing platform. Uh, ISAC is the information sharing and analysis center. Um, there's many different ISACs out there. There's ones for uh, financial, uh, public schools, healthcare, right? Um, so the dedicated HISAC is where these organizations can be connected to other healthcare facilities. If one healthcare facility has indicators of compromise or some type of other um, upcoming threat information that may impact other hospitals, they'll share that information out. Um, so from a day-to-day -day perspective, if you're not already part of the HISAC, be connected to it. Um, the other really critical component of that is if you're not actively monitoring it, that's an issue. Uh, you have to stay up to date on the latest threats. And then if we're talking about maturing up like a security model um, for that organization, the last component I'd say is if your organization or your healthcare facility is experiencing some type of threats, share it back to the HISAC, protect the other healthcare facilities. We're all in this together. Um, we don't operate in a vacuum anymore. Uh, we, we have to help work together to protect the entire industry, right? Yeah, it, it's great. I, one of the things that I wanted to add, I, I, was, I was waiting for you to do, we're all in it together because we are. Um, one of the things I wanted to add on to it was the the ISACs just in general, they tend to be in a significant amount of information. If there were ways to automate that, do they exist today? Uh, obviously, you and I know the answer, but, but everybody listening may not. Uh, but it's not terribly reasonable for every organization to be able to, to get that kind of information, digest it, apply it, et cetera. So what should they do in those particular instances? Yeah, there's this is one of the requirements. Uh, I'm not here to necessarily pitch a product, but one of the requirements of the healthcare industry is you have a SIM which is a security information and event management tool. It's essentially what's collecting all of the logs in the network. You have to retain the data for like seven years and everything. With that being said, though, there are ways to ingest the HISAC data into that SIM tool to parse through it, identify if there was any threats discovered from your network logs, and then raise an alert if something is discovered. Um, that's one of the quickest ways to be able to do that. Um, many, many security tools have these integrations uh, today, but there are still healthcare facilities out there that do not have a SIM in place. It is a requirement. And then the other thing is you can integrate that threat feed into it. So, yeah. So, so just to kind of add that on there, and I know we talked about it already, but the intent of that integration is that it's there to automate the process for you. You're still using that enriched data to help you make decisions and, and detect things that are threatening to your organization in general. Um, I kind of did this earlier too, but, but what's the good news in this? And the good news is, is the healthcare industry is not on its own. We are getting support from the, the government, which we do need. And so that is going to help push this forward. So in my opinion, while this hasn't been approved and passed into law or anything, we are, in my opinion, it is really going in the correct direction. So really excited about that piece. Uh, the next piece that popped on here was authorized cybersecurity training to healthcare and public health sector asset owners, operators on cybersecurity risks, and ways to mitigate them. Looking at statistics again, and I know I've been a little heavy on that in this particular instance, but just to kind of give you that additional context that's out there is over the last several years, there has been a significant improvement in training, whether that's tools or the frequency at which they happen. So uh, looking at stats from 2018, there was over 55% of organizations had not provided any type of mandatory training. Uh, as of last year, that has is down to 44%. So that's that's great. We're going in the correct direction. However, 44% is just shy of half of organizations nationwide that don't have any type of training in place. 
And so, uh, well, I'll pause. I'll let Nate expand on that. Why is it a big deal that the training is in place? What if I've got all these other security tools in place, whether it's the feed from HISAC or having a SIM solution in, in place? Why do I need to train as well? Uh, I really hate this saying um, is employees are the weakest link uh, to uh, security. Um, the reason why I hate that is it just almost tells you that no matter what you do, someone's going to make a mistake, right? Uh, that's why training is so important because I truly do believe that your employees can be the greatest strength as well. Um, when the technology fails, the people can still alert and notify you of misconfigurations, of suspicious activity, something that if the tool misses it, they're still there, right? So empowering them to have a voice um, to even jump straight to the executive. There should be a direct line of communication. And I know this is a little bit off of the, um, the, the training component, but it does go to, uh, you know, if the business leaders are listening to this or watching this, right, is in addition to the training, make sure that there is a direct communication all the way to the top of if there's a security threat, have a voice. And then the reason why I say that is uh, Egress Insider, they had a survey, a data breach survey back in 2021. Um, these are some, I, I would say, pretty somber stats for a security individual in a business is 55% of IT leaders rely on employees to alert them of cybersecurity incidents. And then so that means, you know, whatever tools or whatever were in place, fit, the employees still were 50% of those notifications. Um, here's where it becomes a little bit more somber. 89% of those led to some type of repercussion. Um, that is appalling. Yeah, that's why I said empower the employees to be able to have the trust that if they do report something, even if it was their mistake, there's not necessarily going to be reper repercussions. Um, it only helps protect the long term. And again, taking this a little bit further, it's not just that one incident. It's maybe all the patient data behind that or on the extreme human life tied to that. Right. So and it all starts with training the employees to identify different threats that it, maybe it's suspicious pop ups on their computer. Maybe it's safe Internet browsing uh, practices. Um, using a password manager, right? Uh, don't use the same password. Uh, that, again, we could go many, many different directions on what to train on, but the big thing is people can be the greatest strength. And as the industry is still trying to adopt to the technology, you still need the people. Yeah, excellent points. I, I agree 100% on the, the, the management style of, if something were to go forward and there was a report, going back and punishing or being punitive is, is not a productive way of, of helping to continue to get that feedback because the the workforce is a much larger slice than just the IT department. They are the ones that you're going to look to and say, please help us with this. When it comes to training itself, there are great tools out there. Um, there is, you know, we, we saw a very significant decrease in in-person training over the pandemic for obvious reasons, but you've seen a very good uptick in automated trainings that are out there as well. And they do make a difference. And that includes doing simulated phishing sim uh, uh, attacks. So kind of giving you again statistics and, and I, hopefully I'm not boring you today with statistics, but I'll use CIT as an example is when we first started doing cybersecurity training, our, our failure rate was pretty high. We were over 60% failure rate. And over the years, we've been improving it and, and refining it to the point where we do our training and phishing every single week. We are down to less than 1% of people clicking on links, um, even less than that of, of actually catching them in the act. And so just that sheer volume of training and repetition has a major impact. So if your employees now know what to look for, they can alert us a lot quickly whether we're in the security field, the IT field, or however your organization is set up. So it is a big deal. Again, getting the government behind this and pushing it forward, telling you, you need to be doing this. You need to be thinking about this and will help you get the tools in place. Nothing but great news from my perspective. And then the last item that we came up on here was require CISA to conduct a study to specify 
security risks facing the healthcare in public health sector specifically. What does that mean to you? Why is it good news? What where does it go from here? Uh, it's really, really vague at the moment. Uh, again, Nate mentioned it a while back that there's not a lot of meat on the bone on this particular item, but it does give a lot of good going forward steps. It, it makes the government say, okay, we're going to focus on healthcare because it is one of the major issues. As I mentioned at the beginning, we were talking about $9 million breaches or some type of incident that's significant and it it definitely requires the attention of the security industry but then kicking it up to the government is great too um so i'll pause there and i'll let nate expand on that if he needs to yeah i don't i don't have much just because it is truly a very vague statement i i do believe a lot of this one is directly tied to more of government action just saying do something about it uh, if that was the quickest way i could summarize it is there's an issue do something about it right and so um there's no more turning a blind eye to hey you know that hospital had ransomware that hospital had ransomware that one had it too um there's more of a strategy starting to be put into place uh, and this really isn't anything new um if you go take a look at things like um you know the hipaa long time ago i think that was actually in the 90s and then you had high tech kind of roll around with that with the whole breach notification and uh, actual penalties tied to that. So it's a very slow transition. We're starting to see that rapid acceleration now. Um, this is where even in the last 10 years, we've started to see things like uh, NIST and CISA and IC3, all these different government agencies dedicated to helping with um, the cybersecurity the posture of these organizations start to roll around. This is now just saying government go do additional studies to help feed the pipeline and making those informed decisions. It doesn't call this out. What this may indicate is you might have some um, agencies that are going to maybe seek some information from the, the facility, uh, trying and say, how are you doing it today? What challenges are you facing? It doesn't call it out. Um, might come down the pipeline, but uh, the government typically doesn't like to call or anything. It's usually larger studies than that. So, cool. Thanks, Nate. Yeah. So, wrapping this all up. I mean, uh, long story short, from this, I kind of started the the conversation out. There is legislation out there. There's new acts coming. We anticipate it continuing. For the most part, we see nothing but good news coming from this. And it is really trying to get to the heart of the matter, and it is starting to get to the point where we should see very good guidance. Will there be a little bit of a burden placed on organizations to move forward? Yes, there absolutely will. But don't be intimidated by it. There's help out there, whether it's us or somebody else. There's a lot of really smart people that can help you through the process. It is their job to understand it. It's our job to make sure that we're giving you the, the tools and the guidance you need to move forward. I wanted to say uh, a big thank you both to Todd and Nate today for this discussion. I think it was a really great and valuable um, way to kind of talk about this act that has been out there. But we know that these guys love to talk and they can tangent at times, but it's always a great discussion. So thanks again. Um, let us know if you guys have any sort of feedback about these podcasts. You can visit our website at cit-net.com backslash podcast or by emailing info at cit-net.com. And we look forward to chatting with you more next week. Thanks so much.